I guess I hit him because he started down. He was going to. He tried to land on the water, and he, uh, as he touched down, that port float of his, which was badly damaged, and I could, as I say, I could see many pieces fall out, fly off of when I shot at it. That float collapsed, and his left wing stuck, struck the water, and he just cartwheeled. And he was, he was, uh, well, the three of them, I think they were thrown from the, from the airplane. The three of them were in the, by the time I got there, they were in the water. And they waved at us and I waved back at them. And I felt kind of sorry for them because that water was so cold up there. We were just inside the Arctic Circle in, in October. And, uh, <coughs> We knew how cold it was because we'd had a, a pilot about a month before who was landing aboard the ship and he was drifting a little bit from right to left and he, he landed and he went over the side. So he got right out of the cockpit, was in that water. We had a, a British destroyer was was the plane guard behind us, but you know, but thousand yards maybe and he was there within about 15 or 20 seconds right next to him through the pilot a line and the pilot was already so cold he couldn't hold on to it so they put a boat in the water with a coxswain and four other sailors and they got got over there to him and, and the four sailors went in the water they got him out, and they all got back in the boat, got back to the destroyer, and the pilot and those four sailors all died of hypothermia. That's how cold that water was. And uh, these poor guys that we left there in the water, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think they could have lasted more than five or six minutes. <laughs> but anyway, that's the, that's the only action we saw over there, except our bombers and torpedo planes, and the fire and the other fighters. Did they sank uh, or or managed to run aground? I think it was either six or eight, or eight uh, German ships that were going up and down the coast of. Norway at the time. That's the only action we had over there. The whole, the whole six or eight months we were there. And well, Dennis, I do have a, a question. Um, what you know, you probably don't know, but why were those German bombers out there? They were looking for us. They okay. Yeah. yeah they were. They were searching. Looking for the aircraft here. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. Um, I'm not sure when we need to break for lunch, but I thought maybe I would at least <coughs> hand this to you. Maybe I know I've seen a couple of different paintings people have done of you, um, especially with this big German bomber with the big engines on it. But maybe you can just show that, I guess, while we. Oh. Um, well, this the bomber. Let's see, it doesn't show the. Uh, doesn't show the Ju-88. This is the Heinkel 115, which was the second one. Okay. And because uh, that's Wildcat. And they put this, this is a Jap airplane up here. They, one of the reasons they gave me this and that other thing <coughs> was I, I, I'm the only. Uh, I'm the only ace during the war that shot down both German and Japanese airplanes. Yes, and uh, I guess, uh, by the way, when are we going to lunch? On what? When's our lunch break? Oh, I don't know what time is it? Well, we 
can break now, I guess, or yeah, uh, whatever, you, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then when we do come back, I'd like to hear, uh, just keep, we want to keep hearing the whole story because you're doing such a good job of telling it, but all the differences between the airplanes, which one you liked, which one you didn't like, and just keep telling your whole story. He's doing a great job, right? Yeah, well, I, I want to know this one quick thing. Sure. Uh, what happened to your friend uh, who wanted to join up with you that had the bad heart? Oh, yes, as a matter of fact, he, <coughs> but he got through flight training and they sent him to dive bombers, which is a really great place to send somebody with a bad heart. <laughs> but he, he made two tours out in the Pacific, um, aboard ship and, his, and, and dive bombers. <coughs> After the war, um, he got out, went back up on the Donner Summit where he, he owned some property and, and became a civilian again. And then the Korean War broke out. He was still in the reserve and they called him back in and this time they put him in night fighters, and uh, <laughs> he was operating off a carrier again, only this time at night. And he made two more tours to uh, Korea as a night fighter pilot. Then he came back, and I saw him, and I said, "What are you going to do now, Bill?" And he said. He said, well, I, I got some orders to go to, to uh, Sea Island, Georgia. And they, that's where they had a big radar school and taught people how to operate radars. And he said, I, he said um, that should be all right. He said, I'll just be flying as a target for them and, and all that. And so <coughs> he was enjoying himself. And, he was a reserve, I said, and <coughs> but he came up for promotion uh, about the second year he was there. And he went over the sick bay to take his physical exam for promotion, and uh, lo and behold, they found out he had a bad heart. They kicked him out of the Navy. <laughs> and he, you know, he, he did live to be, a, I think, in his late 60s, he, he died of a heart attack. But <laughs> it took a long time for him to find his bad heart. That dive bombing, you know, the time they go in there and, and then they, they roll over this way or go straight down, Boom, drop a bomb and, and then pull out, you know, and they're pulling out like this and, and uh, pulling about seven, eight, nine G's on those pullouts. That's enough to push your heart clear down to your ankles. <laughs> Bill was quite a, he was quite a guy.
Oh, we started home about a month after that, that action. Those were the only two airplanes we saw the whole time we were over there. And that's one reason I thought we were really a waste of time. And uh, um, see, that was in October. We started home in November. And we pulled into Iceland, Reykjavik, on the way home and stayed overnight and had Thanksgiving dinner in Reykjavik. Then we pulled out of there the next day and, and uh, chugged on back to um, Quonset Point, Rhode Island. And We traded in our wildcats for Hellcats, which were, of course, brand new airplanes and uh, much superior to the wildcat in many ways. So, so there's, I don't, I'm not going to stop you very often, but I, so one's the F-4 and one's the F-6, I guess, is my understanding. But tell us about those two airplanes real quick and then just keep telling the story the way you're doing it. Oh, okay. okay. <coughs> well, the wildcat, they were both really rugged airplanes. But we used to refer to the Grumman Aircraft Factory as, as the, uh, the Grumman Iron Works. Their, their airplanes were so, so rugged. And uh, the, uh, the Hellcat was far superior, much faster, would go a lot higher. Um, had this big R2800 engine in it, which was a fabulous engine. Um, I, I saw one, one of our pilots out in the Pacific <coughs> come back from a, um, a, an attack on uh, I, I, Iwo Jima, not Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and uh, he had been hit with anti-aircraft fire, hit on the engine, and the, the shell was big enough that it tore, it hit on a cylinder, it tore the cylinder right off the engine. And the airplane flew all the way back to the ship and landed. And the, the, the cylinder was gone, the, piston was still there and it was just wrapping around in the air. <laughs> kind of unbelievable. But, uh, and I know I, my, my wingman one day, we were over uh, Clark Field, and we both got hit at the same time on strafing run. And <coughs> we were below an overcast to about not much higher than this ceiling. And, uh, I got hit on, on this run, it was about the third or fourth run, with fire and that just hit, hit the uh, that bulletproof glass windshield right in the center. And uh, it, I was shooting at the time and I got dum 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 and these three big stars show up in my that glass. Ruined my visibility, but they didn't come through. And my wingman off to my right called me at the same time and says, Diz, I'm hit. And I looked over at him and he was covered with oil and blue smoke just pouring out of his engine. So I knew he was uh, going to be out of oil very shortly. 